<laughs> I hope everybody's got a Bible. Is there anyone who hasn't got a Bible? Right, Ken, could you? There's one there, one here, and here. So um, please turn in the Bible, because I want everybody to look at this this morning, uh, to uh, page 519. It's Psalm 34. Right, lovely, good. And this is a Psalm of David. You'll see it says that. Psalm 34 of David. And then it's got a bit in italics before the psalm actually starts. And the bit in italics is to tell us the circumstances that David was in uh, as he wrote the psalm. And there are 14 psalms of David like this that give the circumstances surrounding them. So this is what it says. You'll see it on page 519. Of David, when he feigned madness before Abimelech, so that he drove him out and he went away. And you're probably saying, what on earth does that explain? (laughs) What does that mean? Well, let's ask the Lord to help us to understand as we look at the circumstances and as we look at the psalm this morning. Heavenly Father... We thank you that we've got your precious word in our hands. Help us as we look at it this morning, that you would teach us from it, for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, what on earth is this all about? Well, we read the story of this in uh, the first book of Samuel, chapter 21 and chapter 22. And it's a time when David was running for his life. You might remember that the king at that time was King Saul. Now, he was a very unstable character. And some of the time, he really loved David, and he treated him as his son. And he used to love to hear him play instruments and sing. And then, all of a sudden, he could change And he'd be throwing a spear at David, trying to kill him. And he actually went to tremendous lengths. He hounded him from pillar to post all over the land, trying to kill him. And that's where we find ourselves this morning with this Psalm 34. That's where David is, absolutely running for his life. And Saul is hot on his heels. And so David runs to the nearest city. And it just so happens that this city is a Philistine city. And it's a city called Gath. And it has a king in that city who's called King Achish. Now, it mentions Abimelech in the italics. That's the surname. It's like a surname of this king, like our queen is of the house of Windsor. Abimelech means that that was King Achish's sort of surname of his family. So David runs to this Philistine city. And he's not there very long before people start murmuring about him. And he begins to realize that what they're murmuring about (laughs) is not, not very good And he realizes, actually, he's run into even more trouble. So what are they murmuring about? Well, they're murmuring about something that happened years previously when David was a lad. Because he met a former inhabitant of this city who was rather larger than he was. And his name was? Goliath. Goliath. So David had killed their secret weapon. And so you can imagine them muttering, can't you? Hey, he's that one. You know, he killed Goliath all those years ago. And so David, of course, realizes he's jumped from the frying pan into the fire. And now he's in this city where he has sought refuge. 
and he really wants to get away. And you can imagine him, can't you? Crying out to God, Lord, I'm in such a mess. Help me. And God gives him a very peculiar thing to do. It's in those italics. Feign madness. So if you read the story in 1 Samuel, you'll find out that David started to claw the walls. He started to foam and dribble at the mouth. Just imagine it. And King Achash said, oh, for goodness sake, we've got enough peculiar people here already. We don't need one more. Get rid of him. So that's how David escaped. And he must have thought, I've had enough of towns and cities. I'm going to try the countryside now. And so he runs to the mountains and he finds a big cave, the cave of Adullam. And into the cave he runs. And he's safe there. Word gets around, and some of his family, remember David, he came from a big family. Remember when Saul, Samuel came to anoint him to be the future king, David was the youngest of the family of a great long line. So he got a huge family. Anyway, some of his family get to hear where he is, and they come to the cave to see him. Perhaps they bring him food or a blanket. Who knows? Probably they would, wouldn't they? And then, little by little, other people start to come. People who've... Some refugees, some other people in need, but people who really want to get together with David. And in the end, there are 400 men in this cave. Must have been a mighty cave, a bit like Cheddar Gorge, mustn't it? Anyway, it's as David and this growing number of people come to the cave that he writes Psalm 34. So now, Margaret, we're going to hear it. Thank you very much. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant, so your face shall so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers him. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. O fear the Lord, you his his holy ones, For those who fear him have no want. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Thank you, Margaret. So, they're sitting there in the cave, and David says, come on, let's praise the Lord. And so we get these first uh, three verses, which are a call to praise, aren't they? I will bless the Lord, says David. And in verse 3, come on, let's exalt the Lord's name together, which, of course, is what we've come to do this morning, haven't we? So, first of all, there is this call to praise God together. And then as they sit around, different ones start sharing their story. Did you notice that? Look at verse 4, for instance. Here's someone who obviously was afraid because it said, he delivered me from all my fears. And then somebody else in verse 5 was in some sort of need and uh, God met their need. They looked to God and he met their need. They became radiant. And then in verse 6, here's someone who prayed 
and God answered his prayer. And in verse 7, we've got someone who calls for protection. The Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Someone who was delivered found protection. And then in verses 9 and 10, it talks about young lions and food and God's provision. Here's somebody else who said, yes, God provided for me. So it's like a little testimony meeting, isn't it? With one and another saying how God has helped them and what God means to them. Well, we're going to hear from Pat now, and she's going to tell us something of what God means to her. Uh, I'm Pat Webster. I'm from Sheffield. Um, My dad was born in Northern Ireland. Um, Was an Orangeman. Uh, Came to Britain at the start of the Second World War as a 20-year-old. Uh, was stationed just outside the village where my mum lived. They met, they had a lover dancing. Um, he was shipped off to Burma, Second World War. He, he fought in the jungle with the Gurkhas, who wasn't on the railways. Uh, he came home, married mum, had eight children, of which I am number four. Um, so religion and politics was not um, a subject to be spoke about in our house growing up. Um, older chil- or miss- old- two older sisters left. They had children of their own. And every weekend, 7 o'clock, my mum used to bang on the banister rail and get me up to do the housework. The cleaning, lighting fires, looking after children, doing the washing, starting the lunch. And I did that for two and a half, three years, and I thought, I'm my mum's unpaid housekeeper, I'm not having this anymore. So I went off the rails, as my sister was growing up, she took over a lot more. And I found out what boys were for, and I found out what alcohol tasted like. And for two and a half years, anybody that had set me out for a drink, fine, and I'd, yes. Um, time went on and I, we had a travelling fair and the travelling fair had got this amazing young man with long red hair and a black leather jacket and I thought oh wow and um, I thought he was belonging to the fair but he wasn't, he lived in the next village anyway um, I met up with him two years later and within seven weeks of knowing each other I was 16, he was 18 And within six weeks of knowing each other, we knew that we we were meant to be together. I left home, lived with him and his mum. We got married, had two children. Um, My mother-in-law was a Christian lady, but didn't, she didn't put her faith into your face. She just lived it quietly. She was a beautiful, God-fearing woman. And she took my two children, her grandchildren, to Sunday Club. And they'd been going to Sunday Club for about six months. And it, it, I was still drinking at that time, a lot. My party trick was I could drink a 16-stone man under the table, nine pints of lager and walk home sober. It would funny, but not funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, they'd been going to Sunday Club for about six months. And they said, Mummy, we're having a presentation. Will you come and watch? We've got to go up on stage and shake hands with the minister and receive a book, a book prize. And I thought, church, what? No, there'll be a man in a collar wearing a frock. There'll be cobwebs. It'll be odd pews. Um, It'll be stand up, sit down. It'll be religion. No, not even on my radar. Please, Mummy, please, Mummy, it stops at eight, it stops at eight o'clock. You can go pub after. Okay. And I went, and it was chairs and carpet and a normal mini, in normal clothes. And I'm thinking, this is amazing. What? And I thought, oh, they've, they've, only, um, they've only done this because parents are coming. I'll come back next week. I'll catch them out. No, it was exactly the same. 
And then I found I've got this washing machine type pull in my tummy. I could not wait for Sunday. I had no idea what it was then, but I know now it's Holy Spirit. And uh, they had a weekend uh, called a rally. We were a Pentecostal church. And a minister came. I'd never met this minister before. And he spoke for an hour and a half about my life. Trying to find life in the bottom of a glass. In relationships. Trying to live your life through your children. And I'm thinking, has he been reading my mail? Has he been talking to people I know? And he said, if anything's touched a chord with you this, mo- this morning, um, I'd love it if you could come out to the front so you could have hands laid on you and be prayed and seal what the Holy Spirit's done. But my mother, I'm in the middle of the row, my mother-in-law's there and her friends are there and they're praying. And my sisters-in-law are there and their friends and they're praying. And I couldn't physically get out. So he says, if you feel you can't get out, stand where you are, Put your hands out, close your eyes, and I'll, the Spirit will do it from where you are. So that's what I did. And then I could feel a hand on my head and breath on my cheek. So I cheated and opened my eye, and now I stood at front of church. I don't physically remember pushing past anybody. And it was as though God got me by the scruff of the neck and pulled me into his kingdom. Um, Amazing. I cried all week. Tears of embarrassment. Tears of regret. Tears of shame. Tears of overwhelming love and joy. Amazing that God would want me in such a mess like that. And he did. Uh, We went on to have another two children... I could tell your testimony after that as well. And life's not been easy because I've got... My youngest will be 40 on the 31st of August. Uh, I've got 11 grandchildren. I've got two great-grandsons. One of my grandsons is severely disabled. He's non-weight bearing, he's non-verbal, he's autistic, he's epileptic, really, really ill. He's had... Operation after operation. But God is in it. It is in it with me. Christianity is simple and uncomplicated. Simple that Jesus Christ died on that cross for me. Nine pints, booze in part, died for me. And it's uncomplicated. Jesus died on that cross, took my sin, end of Jesus rose again, went to heaven so I can live in his presence. And it's uncomplicated because you just have to walk the way that Jesus did. But it's hard. But that doesn't matter because you've got Jesus as a big brother to carry your burdens. And that's what he did for me. God rescued me mightily. Thank you. Well, lots of us would have something to share, wouldn't we, if we were in the cave with David this morning, Mm -hmm. as Pat has shared with us. But it's always good to hear a testimony. What would you say, what would I say, if we had the opportunity this morning? Well, you may have noticed that in our verses, there's one verse that hasn't been mentioned yet, and that's the key verse, verse 8. And verse 8 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. That's the key verse. Taste and see, taste. From the moment we're born, we need food, don't we? And we sure know about taste. From very early on in our lives, we know what we like the taste of, what tastes good to us. That soon becomes obvious. And as we eat, so the food becomes part of us. 
These, um, these verses, of course, are not talking about sandwiches, are they? Juicy steaks and strawberries and cream. It's not talking about that sort of food, but it's saying, taste and see that the Lord is good. So how do we taste the Lord? Well, we've just been reminded of, uh, of the truths of the gospel, haven't we? That God loves us so much, loves us to bits, that uh, Jesus came and died on that cross so that our sins could be forgiven and that we might have eternal life. Life given to us to become part of us. When you were at school, perhaps you learned about verbs. It used to be called English grammar. I'm sure you call it something posh now, Lucy, but... uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and you learned about nouns and verbs and things like that, didn't you? <laughs> and we soon learned that a verb is a doing word. And that's what we've got here. Two doing words, haven't we? Taste and see. They are doing words. I hope in your Bible at home, you've not got a Bible that's in pristine condition. I hope you mark it up. And if you do, mark this verse up, verse 8 of Psalm 34, because it's a jolly good verse to remember. It's a good verse to write out and pin up somewhere so that we remember it in that way. Or maybe we'll remember it actually when we are tasting something, tasting food. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those, blessed are those who trust in him. Another version puts it this way, find out for yourselves how good God is. And in a few moments, the same words, really, just put in a different way, feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. So, let's do it. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Father, we have tasted and seen that you are good. Your presence satisfies us like nothing else. You give us more joy and deeper joy than anything else in the world. And please give us more tastes of your presence, more glimpses of your glory, and expand our hearts to love you more. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God and Father of mankind, we pray for all those caught in conflicts throughout your world, thinking especially of the current fighting for control of Afghanistan at the moment. We pray for those fleeing from war and persecution as refugees, that they might find safe places where they are treated with the dignity that they deserve. We pray that hearts and minds of the leaders of our world will be open to find ways to settle long-running conflicts and to work together towards justice, freedom, and lasting peace for all. For you made all nations of the world to be one family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, encourage our brothers and sisters following you in regions of the world where they face persecution for their faith in you. May their hope and faith be an example to all. And We pray that we may gain a deeper understanding of what it means to trust and follow Christ in the world and how that should shape the way we live our lives as God's people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for your church here at St. Peter's. Teach us to be welcoming, open and friendly and to reflect your love in the world. We give thanks for all those that made it possible for your family to continue to come together to worship you during the difficult times that we had, either in person or online and those times of fellowship that we are now able to enjoy. Strengthen and encourage Rachel and Jordan 
in their ministry and help us to remain connected to our local community and make us alert to the ways you want us to serve those around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our visitors from Through Faith Missions this morning, that as they continue their walk, the folk they encounter will be drawn to them to discover more about the good news of the gospel, encouraged by their testimony, and come to you, Lord, and trust in you, Lord. And we pray that their own faith will grow through the conversations and experiences that they have during this mission. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for ourselves, how among the busyness of our lives, we might be still and attentive to your presence, that we may be given a deeper understanding of how you, our loving God, are present in all aspects of our lives and how we can show our love for you. Help us to take the gifts that you have given each one of us and use them wisely to further your kingdom. We pray that no opportunity may be lost to share in the good news of Christ with those that we meet in our daily lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Lord, we pray for your healing touch to rest upon those who are in sorrow, pain, or distress, that they might know the comfort of your loving presence and your peace which surpasses all understanding. In the moment silence that follows, we bring before you the names of those on our hearts. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.